All right, we're going to go ahead with our uh, final session of the day. I think everyone loves each other too much. <laughs> not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. <laughs> all right, so the final session of the day is what I call the lightning round. And uh, the lightning round was an idea that said, what if we just do a bunch of short topics right in a row? Maybe have nothing to do with each other, just a lightning effect bolt shot of an idea. It could be interesting, it could inspire you and in what you're working on. So we have three, uh, three talks that we're going to do, four speakers. Uh, the first one up is, and I always uh, slaughter her last name, is <laughs> Chris Slocum, president of Clarity Quest Marketing. And uh, she's going to talk to us about the different uh, types of ROI that you can get from the various marketing channels. Uh, and also she has something pretty interesting. She kayaked with Wells. So if you want to go kayak with Wells, you should check with her. So go ahead, Chris. Thanks, John. Thanks, uh, everyone. I'm so glad to be here uh, to speak to you. And I'm going to cram a lot of information in 15 minutes. And the talks um, so far today have set uh, my presentation up perfectly. So I'm going to talk about what do you spend your money on if you only have so much money. Um, our agency is uh, 13 years in business. We are an outsourced marketing department for everything from well-funded Series B startups all the way to Fortune 50 companies that have a department, want to do a launch, want to try something out. Um, our team here at Clarity Quest becomes the entire marketing department. So your project manager, your CMO, and then we bring in the resources um, to fill out um, a marketing team for you because we're finding more and more um, in the industries, uh, folks hire marketing last. And that's just reality. Um, so we have uh, software companies, infrastructure companies, hospital IT services, and medical device companies among our portfolio. Um, we often put together an integrated marketing plan um, for companies, and we've had the luxury of doing that. We're getting a lot of feedback. Is it? I can put it back on the stand. Um, so we've had the luxury of being able to take budgets for companies and do uh, integrated marketing plans where we're looking at a whole bunch of different campaigns and then seeing what sticks. Uh, and I'm going to share some of that to you. We've been collecting it over a couple of years um, and I just finally in the past few months figured out how to sanitize this enough so our clients wouldn't get really annoyed at me and I wouldn't be giving away <laughs> confidential information but I could share relevant information with all of you. Um, client profiles, um, I'll be covering data from today. One's a mid-sized company, infrastructure, hardware, um, and some services. Another one is a multinational. Um, another one is an SMB. They're on the enterprise software and services. On the infrastructure side, deals were 100K plus. On the enterprise software and services, 400K plus. So not insignificant. Deal amounts, stuff you're all used to. Annual marketing budgets. Um, for those of you that were in the talk, where they're like, oh, Health Catalyst, that's awesome. Well, yeah, if, if you have that money. Um, but a lot of folks come to us and they say, I got 300,000, I have 400,000. Um, some, uh, we've been lucky enough to have about 1.7 million a year. Um, but you know, you can look at a trade show like HIMS, and there's companies that spend 1.7 million just on HIMS, right? So um, these are uh, mid sized global companies. Um, with reasonable budgets. The target titles, um, the ones I'll be covering today, although we do work for clients that are marketing to physicians, um, the ones I'll be covering today were not marketing to physicians. They are marketing to CIO, CTO in hospitals, IDNs, um, CMIOs, CNOs, and CNIOs. Um, so the nursing executive and chief medical information officer side um, as well. This is one thing that we um, do that I think is pretty unique. Um, and it's assigning your spend for every single thing that you do in your company other than your very baseline foundation um, campaigns. And what are baseline foundation campaigns? The things you have to pay to play. Your website, your business cards, your collateral. Right? Those we're going to call baseline foundation. Everything else, whether it's developing a piece of content whether um, it's an email campaign, whether it's PR, there's assigning that spend across that channel. So for example, you 
create a meaningful use white paper for a client. We'll break that down and say, based on best practices, based on, there's some subjectivity to this, I'll give you that, um, but based on how we're gonna use that content, or say 30% of that spend will go to organic search, 20% to social marketing campaign, 40% to third, gen, uh, third party lead gen programs like a HIMSS white paper campaign, and 10% to pay per click. Um, and if you try and do this just with Excel spreadsheets, you're gonna tear your hair out. It's, it's virtually impossible. Um, we've implemented um, a system, and it's a marketing budgeting system that's in the cloud called Allocadia. I am not paid, I do not get any affiliate marketing from these folks. Um, it is wonderful because it not only allows you to track your budget in the cloud, which many of us have, it allows you to assign spend for every single tactical item across channels. And that's really, really effective um, and gets you a lot of data. So you take this integrated marketing plan and you say, okay, how am I gonna bring all those different things together um, and assign the ch uh, spend across channels? When you do that, um, as we have for the last two years with those three clients that I mentioned, um, we got a normalized cost per qualified lead by the marketing channel. I'm using channel a little fluidly, but uh, you can call it marketing campaign, whatever you like. Um, on the y-axis here, I have normalized cost per lead, um, and on the x-axis, I have the types of campaigns. Um, starts with a normalize, your lowest cost per qualified lead per channel, probably not surprising, is your organic rankings. All right? People can find you on Google, find you on Bing. Um, and then, um, surprisingly though, banner ads um, next. Now these weren't just blanket banner ads, um, they happen to be in very specific channels um, to say the nursing executives, very personalized in their messaging. Um, then we followed up by email marketing, uh, paid search, and that paid search um, are things like the normal pay-per-click, um, AdWords, uh, Bing, but they're also, we can include paid search on social channels. Um, and LinkedIn is a pretty good one, um, actually, if you can find the right groups and target. Um, and then we had things like HIMSS content programs, other third-party content programs, um, general PR and placement, um, and social media uh, next, um, and then way up at the top, trade shows. Um, as you'd expect, I mean, they're pricey, even the smaller ones um, um, are a lot for spend and big, for, big expenses for startups. Um, how we got this data is um, the three clients um, that we worked with uh, had extremely, extremely um, transparent sales teams with us. Um, they were really helpful, they were really engaged, um, they were really diligent in filling out things in their sales CRM, um, and they were very diligent in looking at our analytics um, and doing cross between that. Yes? <coughs> Yeah, so very targeted. This wasn't blanket paid search, um, and it wasn't paid search on anything um, that was the things like $50 a click. <laughs> okay. So we were very, very careful um, on the types of keywords we're advertising on. Um, also using channels that are lower cost per click, like LinkedIn. So these are one thing, but the panel that was just up here, the executive panel, uh, we're saying, I need the conversions, right? And, and that's why I put this together. Um, our agency started having a real initiative to put this together because you know, we were sitting there as CMO or hired acting CMO, um, and the CEO was like, okay, where's conversion data? And like, I don't think we should do email, you know, and why? You know, now we have the data to back it up, right? So now we're looking at conversions. Same chart as before, um, and now I've co colored some in the purple. Okay, so before it was qualified lead, and they truly were qualified lead. We sat down with the salesman and we said, yeah, these are ones that you know I can go have a meeting, they're qualified, they're the right size, right demographic, right number of beds, etc. cetera. Um, but now we look at what costs for qualified lead um, by the channel. And uh, the ones in purple are the ones that actually converted in a nine to 12 month period. And that is a typical sales cycle um, for all of these clients, nine to 12 months. All right, so the ones that can hurt quick, that'll let you get the excitement building, cash flow in the door, um, were these three. And it was organic search, um, and two of the um, clients that I've listed in here had pretty competitive terms. There were clients um, who were in the space for 40, 50 years, um, and we got the clients onto Google page one 
uh, top five rankings within six months. Um, and that has an effect on people just searching for it. And they tend to be, if people are searching for it, they're ready to buy. So it has that. The one that really even surprised me, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Were the differences significant? Differences in? Between, you said that the ones in purple were better converting. They were the ones that, the only ones that converted in nine to 12 months. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The other ones still in discussion, good leads, right? They're still in the funnel, um, but they didn't convert as quickly, right? So the organic search tend to be people, I have a problem, I'm searching for something actively, I found you guys, I'll be ready to buy in the next three to four months, and they were. Um, the one that really surprised me, email marketing. Um, and you know, because I have friends who are CIOs, and they were like, not another email, don't tell me, don't show this at the conference. Um, but email marketing is effective. Um, and the last panel was talking about innovation uh, messaging versus regulatory messaging. Innovation messaging in emails, very effective to the CIO, CTO crowd. Very interesting, whereas the CNO, the nursing executive, they're opening the things on meaningful use all day long. Now, if it was more innovative, tech, no, they wanted to see it specifically to the regulatory messaging. Um, and that was pretty interesting. Now, I'll talk more on the email side um, and what exactly we did there, because there's a lot of ways to do email well and not well. Um, and then trade shows um, actually converted. You know, that's why there's 37,000 people at HIMSS and 1,200 booths, and you know, it, it, it works, it's expensive, and not everyone can do it, but it works. Um, but I'll talk some alternatives to, to HIMSS and RSNA and things like that. Um, so converting healthcare C-level. Um, the key to the email um, was nurture, and starting with really, really good content. Um, and we learned this the hard way, uh, as many of you probably in the audience have when you go asking for the sell on the first one, uh, and an email doesn't work. If you're giving out quality content, um, repetition with it, um, we'd see all of a sudden um, a CIO would come to us and say, oh, this was perfect, I'm building a new wing, I need this. You know, so you had to get him or her right at that particular instance. Um, in all of the client engagements, we used audit marketing automation systems, we used personalization, we had segmentation um, by title. We didn't go completely insane, we didn't have flows with 80 different versions off of them. Um, drip campaigns with some simple flows of who opened um, and who clicked, and then segmentation, and a really clean list um, to start on that. On the organic search rankings, um, you know, keyword targets, pick five. <laughs> Seriously, you know, and I know it's hard sometimes, but if you can pick five and say, we are just for the next year gonna hammer this home, and you do a good job in your content, you do a good job in some of the other integration in the marketing, um, you're gonna get up there. Um, and it's gonna reap rewards and ROI for you. Now you're gonna, a lot of the purists here are gonna look at the data and go, you wouldn't have got the organic rankings if you weren't doing PR or social media. And you're absolutely right. Um, and we did assign some of the spend from PR and some of the sign, a spend from social media into that organic bucket. So when I showed that lowest cost per lead, uh, those numbers were embedded in there. Um, and it just, to do PR for a full PR effort versus doing PR um, for organic rankings can we do two different things? And I know I'll get darts on there, but um, you know, it can be a smaller, lower spend program, um, depending, you know, I gotta get in Wall Street Journal versus I gotta get in some of the trade magazines and use it to support uh, my organic ranking efforts. And then carefully selected trade shows. Um, regional, chime sponsored, golf events with the chime guys, right? Um, nursing conferences. Uh, smaller, uh, the nursing conferences for one of our clients have been wonderful. Um, the, the decision makers are walking the floor as opposed to him. Right? They're willing to have a conversation with you. There's only a couple thousand people at the show. Um, just like this venue here today, we're all getting to know each other. Everyone knows each other's face here by now. You, you get that relationship um, a lot quicker at those shows. Um, so they, they were some of the best conversions um, as well. I think I have a minute, but that's 
We are going to be continually posting um, updated data, probably every six months. Um, it's on our blog. Um, if anyone you know wants to hit me, follow me. Um, we will post it on the blog, and uh, I'm willing to share you know any of the data that I can. It doesn't break any confidentiality. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thanks. Uh, we have about five minutes for each of the speakers. If you have any questions for the individual one. Yeah, so combination of purchased, um, I will tell you, HIMSS Analytics, SKNA, um, and then some clients came with their own in-house lists already um, baked. Um, and then um, whenever they went to a trade show, whenever they did any other campaign, that was brought into the marketing automation system. Because we, we just hear that it's too spammy. Yeah, you know, and that's, a, our, our clients would come and say the same thing, and that's the first thing the CEO would usually go, we're not sending an email. And I go, okay, you don't want to end revenue then. <laughs> and the, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, the data is there, right? You know, and and you do have to be careful. I will say we had very few spam complaints um, for the way we did things. Totally can spam complaint like everyone's doing here. If you're offering quality content, we did have opt outs. Absolutely, and you're going to have opt outs. Um, but the leads that were most willing to talk to you and like we got to meet right away, email. Sure. If they open it, and what was really interesting, um, I have my CIO friend um, in Seattle, um, he said, you know, hey, email, you know, I have my admin read all those, right? But he did give me a hint, which I'll share with you, and he said, I give her three keywords. Don't forward me unless it says this, this, or this. So if you can get those three from your target markets and find what they tell their admin to forward, that's cool. <laughs> what was the name? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a game. How early are you uh, slicing up your demographics for your LinkedIn ads? Because I haven't heard that many people talk about a lot of success with LinkedIn ads, but it seems to be working for you. Uh, the group, you know, the ads to the groups, yeah. um, especially if you feel like AONI for nurses or nursing executives um, can be effective. So it's finding um, those niche topics, you know, whether they're radiology um, specific IT folks. Um, the narrower the niche, of course, the better. It gets smaller in terms of your target volume, um, but again, having some good conversations come out of those. So we, we would take, so we'd get the first, you know, five uh, five or six men or women that are CIOs that were interested, we'd go see all the groups they belong to, right? <laughs> and then we, we'd get engaged on those. Um, and another one, like for social thing, which is kind of interesting, I didn't hear anyone, but social has this interesting dynamic with the email. Um, and if you send out the emails, see who forwards it. Your marketing automation system will, will give you that data, right? See which guys forward that to their social channels. You got all your social influencers right there. I love that you pointed out the smaller conferences. Are your clients speaking there or are they simply attending? Uh, some combination of both, yes. Uh, some of them, you know, are tabletop and then there's a, you know, 15 minute speech like this. So. Any other questions? Thanks, Chris. Thank you. All right. The next in our lightning round is actually a it's a two for you get two for one. So uh, we have two wonderful speakers. Uh, Shane Tachikawa, pretty close. No, you She's the uh, PR specialist at Stoltenberg Consulting, and uh, Shane Pilcher, he's the VP at Stoltenberg Consulting. And a couple of interesting things about them, uh, besides being PR specialist and VP, uh, I've been told that Shana should not be, you should not go for a drive with her, unless she's driving your social media. But uh, something interesting about Shane is that, uh, that he, he has spent 21 years in the Navy. So I think that's worthy of an applause. So we'll turn it over to, to Shane and, and Shana. So while they're switching out the PowerPoint, I'll go ahead and start since we only have 15 minutes and it's not counting, so it doesn't count against me. Uh, <laughs> so when it came time for us to start planning for hymns, uh, we knew that we wanted to do a campaign. 
but a uh, campaign that, to steal the phrase for this morning, was marketing but did not come across as marketing. It had to be natural. It, uh, it had to be comfortable and it had to be us. It also had to, to be completely integrated across all of our paid media outlets, um, our owned media outlets, and uh, our earned media outlets. So it had to touch everything. Um, it also had to be a theme that we could integrate and carry into hymns into our booth and just kind of make it an entire approach. One thing that was very important to us as well was that it was able to incorporate our core um, principles, which is uh, being a good corporate steward. We've been in healthcare IT for 20 years now, and uh, we have a passion for it. So any way that we can give back in some way to make it better, uh, it's very important to us. So we wanted a, a, a campaign that would increase our sales, increase our bottom line, but also make the, uh, the industry better. Um, and so we knew that one of our strengths is being able to have that conversation and develop that relationship with our clients. We really turn them into partners and we have that, that deep um, relationship. So we're good at asking the questions and, and digging down and identifying the, the, the true issues and by knowing them as well as we know them, we have to come up with a resolution that fits best for them. So we wanted to expand that, that reach. Um, and so we developed the what if for HIT, exploring the future of healthcare IT by one question at a time. And the whole premise was that we wanted people to ask the question. What was that burning question that they were always wanting to ask if they haven't been able to? What if all the challenges were removed? You didn't have the financial challenges or the resource challenges or the technology challenges. And instead, any question could be answered. What would that question be? What, would, what are the burning questions you would ask your data? that um, you might not be able to have get, gotten answered before. So we also knew that um, to start that conversation, we had to come up with some seeding uh, seeds that we're gonna plant and, and kind of launch that. So we developed our uh, list of questions that uh, fit within 140 characters <laughs> and also uh, was able to fit into our hashtag that we launched uh, that Shana will talk a little bit more about. But it was very important that those questions, and which are some of the examples that we're asking, they had to directly relate back to a service line that we offered. So we had to be able to have an answer. So it wasn't just about starting the question. And we knew that once the questions got going, that it could go viral and, and you know a lot of questions would start coming in. But we ultimately wanted to make sure we could take those questions and start providing answers to it. So, uh, those are the, um, uh, the questions that we started kind of putting out there on a, on a schedule to uh, start tweeting and start getting, generating that information. And then uh, um, I will have Shana start telling you how we did all the pieces to it. Um, so then the first thing that we needed to do in order to move this idea of what if into actual action for um, what was essentially a hymns campaign for us um, was to really make sure that first of all our company itself understood what what it was so that meant that we needed to have our leadership team involved um, and willing to participate in the conversation as well as our company as a whole so we are um, healthcare IT consulting firm and we have consultants who are um, located and dispersed throughout the nation um, so because of that we're sometimes at a disadvantage in the fact that we don't have that um, and while we are based in Pittsburgh, uh, we don't necessarily have that great opportunity for us all to be together all the time. Um, so in order to communicate our goals for our HEMS campaign and then for uh, to engage them to participate in this campaign, we um, informed the consultants and the company as a whole by um, commuting, communicating through um, internal emails as well as communicating on um, conference calls, our quarterly conference call that uh, everybody participated in. And then for our leadership team, we made sure to um, give updates about the campaign and all the different tactics we were planning to um, go about at the HIMSS conference and make sure that they were ready to participate as well from our HIMSS booth. Um, and then going into HIMSS, we had some uh, things that we needed to do beforehand. Um, so that included our media pitches, obviously, um, then we developed um, a website of it, so developing the web page for our HEMS campaign, um, and then also doing those initial what if tweets, uh, so going to that hashtag that we have on there, the what if for HIT. So we had um, our industry leadership 
serving as um, that thought leadership to generate those questions. And then um, as the weeks continued on in the month to month and a half beforehand, we had more people catch on and uh, see these tweets to the what if for HIT and start to tweet in their own questions and even their own responses to those questions. Um, and then other things that we did beforehand were uh, we had blog promotion, press release promotion. Um, we also incorporated it into a YouTube video to explain what if and what, what if is, um, as well as Facebook, Twitter, as we said, and LinkedIn. So here are some just quick images. We also had some ad designs for banners and things that we had to create beforehand. So those are some examples. And, um, a press release and YouTube video. Um, and then we also had some blog content during the HIMSS conference as well as beforehand. Um, and then another thing that we did was we actually moved towards uh, going for sponsorship. Uh, this is the first time we'd ever done something like this, and it was actually with John Lynn, so works out that we're speaking at this conference. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm yeah, <laughs> yeah, to talk. Um, so we worked, we worked with um, Health Care IT Central, um, and we worked with John and Glenn, or John and Glenn, John and Gwen, um, I was thinking of John Glenn. <laughs> um, so we worked with John and Gwen, and they were great in helping us develop um, an email blast campaign as well as sponsored tweets that actually, even though they were sponsored tweets technically, it seemed to come across as very organically in the fact that these were, oh my gosh, these were um, questions that we ourselves were wondering as well as people who were engaging in this, um, in including John, were wondering and hoping to see what other people would respond. Um, and then once it came time to uh, right before him, so we actually have an organization that we created um, with one of our targeted groups, which is Chime. So we created a group called the Women of Chime. Um, so we sponsored an event with our Women of Chime event, which is a gathering of female CIOs. Um, and we had an event at Disney the night before the HIMSS conference started. Um, so it was between the uh, Chime Spring Forum gathering and then before him started. Uh, so we had a gathering for all of them um, that we could all get together, have dinner, drinks, and watch the fireworks over Disney. But at the same time, it was an opportunity to introduce this What If campaign to um, our target audience in person for the first time. Um, and we actually um, were able to kind of engage them in the fact that a lot of them aren't necessarily that involved in social media, especially Twitter. So we actually, at the event, taught a lot of them how to even create their own Twitter handles and their own Twitter accounts and tweet to hashtags and explain what all of that is. Mm -hmm. um, and we also had these little uh, thought bubble cutouts that we put around to each of the tables, understanding that some of them may not still tweet, but that doesn't mean that they don't have what-if questions of their own. So they wrote their little what-if questions on those thought bubbles. And we incorporated that into a board at our booth um, at HIMSS. So then that goes into our booth. So um, our booth, if you were on the show floor this past year, we are the booth that has the geodesic dome. So this is just a side view of it. So um, we incorporated in our booth a lot of those what if questions, um, as well as onto messaging in the front of the booth with lots of question marks and things like that, as well as this large tree structure. So um, our design our design goal is to definitely stick out from the more modular designs of everyone else. Um, and then, like I said, we also had this uh, board that we posted those what if questions on. So as you can see in the bottom picture there, those are some of the women from our Women of Chime event um, learning how to use Twitter, so from their phones, as well as filling out those uh, what if uh, questions. And then some of them came and posted up their, those questions onto that board that was at our booth. So that was really cool that we can incorporate that. Um, and then also at our booth, we had uh, bracelets that we gave out to people that had the hashtag on it, um, as well as handouts, obviously, um, ads that we uh, created and designed to put on the show floor, um, as well as um, live feeds of the tweets as people were tweeting them in from that hashtag. And then we also made sure to educate our booth staff, especially our sales team, on what the what if theme is and how we can incorporate that into our actual service lines and making it come full circle for our company. So that's just a 
large view of the space. Um, so altogether, we felt that this was a, a successful campaign for us, and it's the first time we've ever really um, tried a full circle campaign like this. Um, so especially from the social media aspect, it was successful for us because it expanded our number of followers, but also expanded our impressions. Um, so we tracked our success through um, things like tweet reach, as well as, um, and we displayed our tweets on the live view through visible tweet um, on our board at our booth. And then we also tracked link shares through Bitly. And then um, we also made sure to monitor our Google Analytics and um, incorporating those UTM tags into things that we sent out through email blasts. I will say that we had a we had one interesting question that we all thought to, when they when it was submitted during the conference they uh, they thought it was a joke and, and we had a good laugh about it, but it truly turned out to be prophetic. It was what if the ICD ten deadline is not real? <laughs> <laughs> so. So that, um, that would have question actually came up again, obviously, recently, so it was interesting to come full circle for that. Um, but then also a great thing about the campaign was that we saw traction even after him. So we had um, bloggers and media follow up and say how great this campaign was and how it was interesting to um, see that we were incorporating what people are really wondering and questioning about the industry, but then also present it into what we can offer. Um, and also we had pick up from a lot of um, just top 10 blogs and things of trade show media and saying that it was something that stuck out, so that was cool. And we, even from, I think, members within this room, so um, Jeff Bernard from uh, Philly, and she did a, a recap post that we were featured in, and that was great. And I'm pretty sure that post itself had 60 retweets from it, so just from the actual article straight from that, and I'm sure more from the actual post on Twitter, so thank you. And, it was great to see everything come full circle and we hope to do something like this again. Right. Any questions? Yeah. So the original tweets that went out, um, were you sending folks over to a landing page? And if so, what was on that? Yes, um, so the original tweets that went out were the initial um, what if hashtag as well as a, a quick little explanation of uh, kind of a teaser to get people interested, but then also um, a short bit.ly link to go to our web page that we created, hosted specifically for the What If campaign and our HIMSS campaign, and to explain what it was. And so that page then had the press release information, the video that we put together where Shane spoke on it, um, and then some feedback from people who had already submitted their What If questions. And then we also, to, to kind of seed it a little bit further, uh, those uh, those few that, the, the few um, staff that wanted to, to text or tweet within the company um, or if they're interested in learning we also taught them how to help them set up their their tweet twitter account but we would have them retweet our from our stoltenberg account so that you know it's still their brand is it, we're kind of controlling the verbiage it's just it, it's just showing more and more more activity any other questions just out of curiosity how far advanced go in that well, sometimes we do things on the fly, but luckily this time <laughs> we're always planned out. But luckily, um, we had actually this the what if campaign was actually a backup plan from last year. Um, so, in thinking about our hymns theme six months before hymns, we were like, "Hey, let's do what if? Why didn't we do that?" So, we decided on a theme probably six or seven months before the HIMSS um, show, and then we started our rollout of everything um, probably two months beforehand, and then the actual tweeting uh, a month or a month and a half beforehand, just because if it was too far out, we figured people would get tired of it. If you could change anything, what would you change? How do you change perfection? <laughs> I would think um, I think the, the, that there's more opportunity of follow up. So those those then we can we can still because of the Twitterverse we can still go and follow up. But uh, but make sure that we're reaching out to everyone that did submit a, a question and. Um, turning that into, or at least providing an answer in some way. So. 
It's also uh, teaming up with hymns to, to help promote that during, uh, during the hymns. <laughs> uh, uh, if I just found one of the ambassadors, I'm going to let them know. <laughs> so I actually have a question. Uh, was this driven by the business side where you wanted to know the answer to what if, or was it driven by the marketing side that thought it would be an interesting yeah, because I mean, I, that's why I really loved it, is it was both. But who, who, who drove the initial idea, you know, how, and, and how did you make it happen for both sides? Because uh, I think a lot of people have great ideas but can't drive the other side, too. Well, as is a lot of our great ideas, our owner and CEO, shameless plug, uh, <laughs> Sherry Stoker. She wishes she could be. Yeah, she's she, probably watching right now, yeah. So um, she actually came up with that idea. and, and um, we're always intrigued, intrigued by asking questions, and it was a, a, a very kind of uh, um, just throwing a thought out of, of what if we could ask questions, and then that just kind of picked up. Um, and the, the more we talked about it, the more we discussed it and liked it, the more excited marketing got into it. So we were able to start throwing ideas continuously and build off people. So it was almost more of an engagement for the event, and then it kind of grew into more of a marketing as well. Oh, absolutely. And uh, what we'd like to see as well is to be able to continue it on into, um, if the hashtag will continue to live into its own web page, its own website, that, that can continue to, to be a conversation tool in the industry. Well, thank you so much. Let's give him a round of applause. Speaker of the day. I think we saved the best for last. <laughs> so this next speaker is actually a, a, a friend of mine. Uh, do you want to come pull it up? Uh, he he uh, he's got a really interesting background. He's a he's a Vegas uh, local like me, and uh, he, his idea actually came out of a startup weekend. Which I don't know if you know what a startup weekend is, but it's. You show up Friday at a place like this, and by Sunday, you launch the idea. So that's what Startup Week is. Anyone can pitch the idea, you form teams around these ideas. You may have never worked with them, you may never work with them again. So this idea originally started as Startup Week, and he, he, he met some interesting people and cultivated it there. Uh, but he's also an interesting person, uh, because before he started down this startup path, he was uh, studying to be a, uh, a clergy, right? A, a missionary. So uh, he, he had a, uh, a pivot, as the startup world might say, <laughs> and he, he started a company called Prime Loop, which really tries to do data tracking for PR. So I'm excited to introduce uh, Thomas Canole. Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I have a couple questions. One, if you could raise your hand in the air if Wave it like you just don't care. Um, <laughs> you can put your hand in the air if, uh, if your customers or clients, um, uh, if you have them. <laughs> so if you have customers or clients, your hand should be in the air. Okay. Um, and then leave them in the air. Um, and uh, leave, it, leave your hand in the air if, that, if those customers or clients are people. <laughs> Okay, you can put your hands down. Uh, does anyone have customers or clients who aren't people? No? Okay. This makes it so much easier. Wow, thank you. Um, so a buddy of mine, we've been, uh, we did like kind of a book tour, except we don't have a book. Um, and, uh, and we were talking to people um, about, we call it the voice of the customer. We made like a logo of ears. Those are ears, but they're kind of hard to get it. Um, love your customer. Anyway. Um, and uh, so I'm just reusing uh, that logo, but that's not really where I'm going to use it all. Um, so it's just going to be in the little bottom corner right here from now on. So that's what that was. Um, my, my Twitter is uh, Thomas Kennell, that's my name, but there's no space. Uh, and the name of my company is Prime Loop. That's my day job, um, but I'm going to drop it there unless it comes up in the questions. Um, before uh, I did this whole startup thing, um, I worked on a startup called Seismic. Uh, we sold to a company called Hootsuite. Um, so I have some socially background things. Not socialist, but socially. Um, 
And then after that, I'll start a company called User Voice, which gets feedback from consumers on the website, makes it really easy to get that. Um, and then I was a community architect at a company called uh, Zappos. Um, they sell shoes and happiness. Um, and uh, after that, uh, did another startup and then uh, started this company. Uh, so for 17 years I've been building online community for brands and organizations. That's the funny part about the almost being a missionary thing was instead of helping churches get more customers, I started helping businesses get more evangelists. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I hear things from big brands all the time, like, we don't need to talk to our customers, they're happy with the stuff that we send them, but we have awesome customer service, um, uh, we have awesome self-service, so we don't need to talk to them, go to our knowledge base, it's, it's amazing. Uh, phone calls don't scale, uh, used drip tr marketing triggered emails. Um, anyone said or heard any of these things? No one has ever said or heard any of that stuff. <laughs> really? You've heard it? So if you've heard it, raise your hand. Okay, so I'm not, I just want to make sure, because I can turn this in a whole different direction if it's like not, not relevant. Um, so there's an interesting thing that has happened, and that is that it has taken like 30 to 70 years for every channel for talking to people to get adoption. Some of these dates are crazy. Like, the first email was sent in 1971. When did you have your first email account, like personally, that you used? Probably was like maybe the 90s, probably 2000. Um, first text message, what was that one? Like the first text message was sent in 93. Who had a cell phone in 1993? Yeah, Zach Morris. <laughs> exactly. Like there was there was a few of those. Like it was it was like this, and you had a tape that you had to put on top of the car, and you had to plug it into a car battery. Um, right, so it seems like like most of these channels have taken a long time to get adoption from whenever they first exist until it's something that's used regularly. Um, obviously, lately that has accelerated uh, much more quickly. And so the time from when someone might have their first Facebook account to whenever a company is trying to use that as a channel to talk to people um, is much shorter. That also means we don't have much time to figure out what's happening with those types of channels. Um, and, and they seem like computers because they're mostly built on computers now. And so um, we start to treat people like computers, but they're not computers, they're people. So conversions aren't charts and graphs that look nice on your wall. Those are a visual representation of the number of people who have become your customers or users or clients. Um, they're people. I don't know if I said that. Um, and not only that, but the way they have conversations, the way they engage with other brands, which are ultimately just people with a logo, um, are through things like this, right? They take their lives with them in their pockets. Um, and so, uh, some interesting things that happen, uh, and now I'm gonna get like going really fast and I might get confusing, so I'm sorry if that happens. Um, when I was at Zappos, we, we learned a really interesting thing. We separated the customers who we had a personal interaction with. And at Zappos, that's called PEC, which stands for Personal Emotional Connection. The segment of customers who we had a personal emotional connection with from the customers who were entirely self-service. They never had to interact with anyone. They were just, they came, they bought something, they returned it, they clicked on the site. They never had to interact with a person. And the customers who we had a personal interaction with, cart sizes were 30% bigger. And they ordered 2.6 more times per year. And they referred three or four times as many new customers. And lifetime value goes from 18 months to six years. And those are, what's that called whenever it's not linear but you they multiply exponential, 
There we go. That, those things are like, it's like compounding interest. Um, and that's ironic because it's interest like I'm interested in what you're saying as well as money, get it? Um, so, so some interesting things there. But what happens is most brands, whenever they decide like, oh, we're gonna invest in engaging, we're gonna invest in, in, in these you know, win back campaigns and now we're gonna care what people are saying and actually answer their questions or be helpful or be friendly, it's not in the acquisition end of things. Like it's like, let's just keep the cost as low as possible. Let's find the most efficient channel to just convert people in there. And then they're trying to figure out, is this the right thing for me? Am I using something to use it? And they get to the end, and like, oh, we're losing people. Like, well, we should start investing in like answering the questions and making sure that they're gonna stay. Um, or they say they're like, hey, we've been using your product for a little while, but now we're gonna leave. And so you start investing, that's too late. Compared to the same amount of investment very early on in that cycle of being able to make personal, emotional connections with people to help them become your customers, stay there longer. They trust you more, so they stay loyal. They believe in you, so they refer their colleagues and friends to come check this out as well. And they start doing a lot of that expensive work for you. Anyone know who Chris Brogan is? Okay, a couple Chris Brogan people. He's a guy, he talks and he writes things. Um, he's really good at it. Um, and uh, he's, he's a really cool guy. He's, I got a chance to, to meet him. Uh, if you haven't heard him before, type it down or something and you go read some of his stuff, you'll probably enjoy it. Uh, but he's really focused on small business. Like, what is all this googly Twitter stuff um, for small businesses? Um, and he writes this newsletter on Sundays um, which is different from like all of his content, marketing, information, rich, dense, or other words that are buzzwords. I don't know, I'll say there. Um, he does all those things, but Sunday is kind of like this more personal newsletter, and he almost always starts off like in the, after he says hello in some foreign language he just Googled, um, then he'll tell you what he's drinking. He's like, oh, I'm having a hot cup of water with lemons from the garden today. What are you drinking? Um, who cares what Chris Brogan is drinking? That's not conversion rate optimization. He's not, you know, maximizing the the density of content, whatever buzzwords I still can't remember. But here's the interesting thing. He says that he gets more. First of all, he doesn't send out his email from "Do not reply to me ever because I don't care who you are" at nameofmycompany.com. He sends it from like, please reply to me because I like you and I think you're interesting at his name of company. Um, so most of the people who reply, the first time they ever reply to him, it's like, oh, I really like matcha tea as well. Where do you get yours? Or like, I can't believe you're drinking cinnamon, cranberry, water, lemon today because that's what I drink too. Um, and then he writes back, and he's like, oh, that's so cool, yeah, I get mine over here. And then they're like, so I've been meaning to ask you, but I haven't because that's awkward and 85% of people don't actually engage. Right, you've heard of like the 85, 10, 5% thing. 85% of people just lurk, 10-ish percent will like share, reply, click a little star or a heart button. Um, it's only like the five, maybe one percent that uh, actually ever create anything. So those people are in that 85, and I never actually do this because it's awkward, but now I'm going to because you cracked through this humanity wall um, with what you're drinking. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so by show of finger pointing, Besides John, who's the most likely to participate in an on-stage demonstration? On the count of three. So get your pointers up so you're ready to point it at the person <laughs> who's going to be most likely to participate in something. Ready to point? On the count of three. One, two, three. That's you. I'm not going to ride in a car, but I saw a lot of fingers. Okay, if you can help me out real quick. Perfect. So we're safe. Um, hi, welcome to Starbucks. My name is Thomas. What can I get you? Um, I do not drink coffee, so hot chocolate. <laughs> hot chocolate? Okay, we make that. Uh, do you want our fair trade picked by 
uh, not children, um, uh, Mexican chocolate. Okay. And uh, what was your name? Shana. Shana, thank you. Let me do this. Okay, we'll call your name when that's ready. Thank you. Give her a hand. <laughs> I'm Starbucks. I'm a huge multi billion, trillion, whatever, alien uh, size company. There's three on that corner and two over here. Um, why do I ask you your name when you give me your order? Personal. So you can say the name back to the person. So you can say the name back to the person. And when your order is ready, it's not calling a number; it's calling a person. It's not a number; it's a person. Which of those reasons sound optimized? How many transactions does Starbucks do a day? Bazillion. Bazillion. Point two. They do a bazillion point two transactions a day. Does asking people their name, writing it down, saying it back to them, does that sound efficient? Yes. yes. No. <laughs> it's much easier to hand you the number that automatically prints off on the card. Does that sound optimized? What if we can't say their name right? What if it's offensive because we do this, you know, or whatever? Um, we're smart and we know that there's a value to this, but I guarantee if you're sitting in any of your own offices or your client's offices, or you're trying to decide how to shave point two off of your budget for the year, you're going to try to throw things like that away. You're like, oh, we should respond to every tweet. That doesn't sound efficient. That doesn't sound optimized. That doesn't sound like it would actually be work at scale. No, we're not gonna do that. Interesting, two interesting things that happen. One, we do I have like a minute left? Jeez. Um, okay, really fast. So first of all, there's a chemical in your brain called oxytocin. It's related to mothers and nursing and the sense of belonging and the feeling that you belong in. When you hear your name, John, a little squirt happens in your head. And it's like more all the way through. And you feel like you belong. I thought I told you not to shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Circle like of trust is broken. <laughs> but you feel like you belong. And when they say your name, you feel like you belong. And that's not Starbucks. That's my Starbucks. If we're going to go have a meeting, where am I going to invite you to? Some random place? Or the place where someone knows my name and remembers my drink order because I keep going back there because they say my name. Uh, Macy's. Is there a Macy's here? Where is the customer service desk at Macy's? Who knows? <laughs> what about Sears? Herbiger's. What else? What are the other plate? What are department stores? JC Penney. Where are their customer service? Top floor, in the back corner, behind the luggage. Do they want you to go there? Lights are out. Lights are out, you can't even see anything. So the bathrooms are, they haven't cleaned them in a while. Um, where's the customer service center at Nordstrom? Everywhere, right? Anyone will help you. And guess what people who work at Nordstrom, um, so someone comes in and they bring back this sweater and like, ah, oh, it's a little bit too small. And then someone else comes in, like, yeah, this sweater was a little bit too small. Why are you returning this today? Oh, well, this sweater actually like, fit a little bit small. They go in the back, they call the buyer, tell the buyer all of these are coming in undersized. The buyer puts a hold on it. They change the entire operations of the business because they can have those types of conversations because they're having personal conversations with their people. Um, so you probably can't see this. These are two airlines. This line has to have circled, that's the operating margin. This is 0.1, and this one over here is 7.5. Two airlines. Do you want to guess who's operating with margins of 0.1? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to guess who's operating with margins of 7.5? Oh, 
When you think of airlines who care about their customers and will have personal interactions with them, which of those two airlines do you think of? Do you know that they both buy the airplanes from the same place? They only have two options. Do you know that they both can hire all of the same people to work and fly and work at their airlines? So the only thing they do is one says, we're going to care about our people, and the other one says, let's try to shape margins. I'm like so expired, I just have to stop. Um, <laughs> so guess what? You should care about people, you should do that at the beginning, you should be willing to have conversations with them, and that matters. It really matters because of business reasons. Because when people trust you, they're loyal. When people trust you, they invite their friends to come be a part of their business where they do business. And when people are happy because they feel heard and listened to and they feel like they belong, they'll stay with you for years and years and years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so we have two minutes maybe for questions because uh, it seems like we'll have to have him back, if there's a next year, we'll say. <laughs> we'll have him back again to speak. Uh, anyone have any uh, question or two? So tell uh, us about Prime Root. <laughs> um, it's a plan. So I would love to, so Thomas at primeloop.com, I would love to chat with anyone uh, who might be interested in hearing why there might be a product that exists that enables you to quantify the value of your PR and social engagement and enables you to increase the amount of conversions that you get through having personal conversations because we will show you, um, still people are afraid, that like, oh, we can't respond to everything, so we're gonna do nothing. Um, we'll help you discover the best places to start and then you can go deeper uh, as time goes on. Any others? <coughs> All right, let's give him a big round of applause.